Um, hello, my name is Taylor Pence. Um, I'm going to be talking about TensorFlow and neural networks today. Um, this talk, when I submitted it, um, it was a different time. Since then, Apple has changed things a little bit, so um, it's going to be an interesting talk in that sense because it's changed, the TensorFlow landscape has changed and the neural network landscape has changed a little bit. Um, but before we start, can I just get a quick show of hands? Just put up your hand if you worked with neural networks before. Um, as a hobby or profession. So I would say four or five people. Um, and that's my experience as well. It's very new technology. Um, I had the chance to kind of get dropped into it or rather eased into it over the last four years um, just because of some clients that I've been working with. Um, but actually, it's very uh, nascent technology and it's early stages still. Um, so this talk probably should have been called something like this, um, truly. Uh, it's you know using TensorFlow, CoreML, Metal, Performance Shaders, Accelerate BNNs, Keras, and what the heck is a neural network anyway is a better title. Um, we are going to be going over all this jargon and all this terminology. There's a lot of um, stuff that I think makes things more confusing than they should be. Um, a lot of people treat neural networks as if they were some black box or some magic thing. It's actually very simple mathematical um, equations. What really happened was that we got more and more processing power so we can actually do this now. So it's nothing new um, and once you open up and simplify things I think it's fairly easy to understand. Um, so before we jump into it I'll talk a little bit about what I do. So I run a consultancy, software consultancy called Hippo. Um, we're focused on startups that do um, that use innovative technology in their products. So we kind of specialize in doing R and D work for uh, a lot of startups in North America, um, and we are kind of multi-platform. So we do everything on Android, iOS, web. Uh, we do a lot of infrastructure scaling. Um, so we kind of tend to look at things from a more um, wide range of view rather than just iOS and Apple. Um, one of our clients um, for the last four years is Field Guide. Uh, Field Guide is a platform for collectors. Um, it started out as a personal collection platform for hobbyists and naturalists, but it kind of um, turned into, over the last few years, a platform for natural history museums to um, catalog their specimens and identify and classify their specimens. This can be anything in the natural history field. It can be moths, butterflies, um, mollusks, gast gastropods of any kind. I'll show you some examples. Um, so it's an open platform. Anyone can submit their catalogs, create their catalogs, um, and you know you have this very image-driven kind of um, way of viewing these catalogs, but there's also very deep um, natural history category hierarchy um, in the natural history field. It goes on average around like 12 levels deep, um, and every specimen that we get actually gets location data. It gets additional um, info fields around um, all these different attributes of the specimen. So we have this kind of multifaceted database that we can search in different ways and, and we can also suggest um, identification uh, results based on images. Um, back in 2014, when we launched, um, we had under a thousand specimens in our database. We had around a hundred categories. Um, so at this point, a big focus and a big requirement from the community was we want to use you know, computer vision to be able to identify because you know, they would have these printed catalogs, these actual field guides, and they would flip through and try to match, visually match patterns on butterflies or you know, moths or different specimens. Um, so the ask from us was, can you guys figure this out? So we went to a few um, actual researchers in this field. We worked with a few different universities. Uh, we worked with the people from Berkeley. Um, at that point, neural networks were still very in early stages. Um, it wasn't really considered to be something that you could use in production. So uh, we didn't really go with a uh, neural network at first. Uh, but our approach back then was still interesting because it kind of it's still valid today. We still use parts of it. So I'll quickly run through what we did back then, so you can kind of see our journey. Um, so this is a Hesperidae butterfly. Um, when you want to understand 
what's in this image, obviously, you know, to the computer, to, to an algorithm, this is just uh, pixels. So what you first try to do is apply different kinds of visual filters to extract different shapes, textures. Um, this can be actually dependent on the kind of stuff that you're looking for. So we would actually build these filters based on the natural history category that we're, that we're looking for. So it would be different for butterflies, but then we would use different filters for uh, mollusks. Um, so you can use something like this, you can use standard edge detection, you can play with the, um, you know, uh, the thresholds, and what you get in the end is a processed image that you downsample, and then for every pixel within that downsampled image, so let's say you have a 64 by 64 downsampled image, um, you extract the RGB values, you multiply them, and then you get a single floating point um, number, right? Um, then what you do is you put this on a matrix, 64 by 64 matrix. This gives you what's called the geometric hash. Um, I don't understand how geometric hashes work. You just use the algorithms that have been out there for a while. Um, and what this enables you is, when you get a new image, you're able to do the exact same things, and then you create another geometric hash that you can run a similarity search against. And it's very fast, like, you know, in a PostgreSQL database, you can run, uh, even on like a fairly large, like a 10,000 specimen a database that we had um, a year later, uh, we could run like 200 millisecond, 250 millisecond queries um, on these uh, databases. So um, you're able to then match the uploaded image into specific specimens that you have, and those specimens have categories that were actually identified and corrected. So you can say, you know, we think this is A, B, or C. Um, so this was the very simple approach that we took back then. Uh, but this was state of the art. Um, and of course by back then, I mean 2014. Um, so just fast forward a year, um, and in, or two years, in early 2016, late 2015, um, we had reached a thousand categories. So our database scaled horizontally, but unfortunately our specimen database didn't grow as fast. So we had around 10,000 images, 10,000 specimen images, and we had around 1,000 categories. So that's not a good place to be because you have a horizontally scaled database, you have a lot of categories, and what happens is, of course we don't know what the difference is between a butterfly and a gastropod and a bird. So when someone uploads one, um, you know, we would be suggesting butterflies for birds. We would be suggesting, in some cases, you know, a weird mollusk with different textures on it for a moth, and, and that's the kind of system start to uh, fall apart. So this is the point where we said, okay, we need something a bit more intelligent. We need something that can understand different things and tell us what it sees. So we turned to ImageNet. Um, ImageNet, if you're not familiar with it, is a research database. It's an open database of pre-tagged um, identified images. Um, it's based on WordNet, which is, uh, I don't know how many, I think over 30,000 different nouns uh, in the English vocabulary. Um, so what ImageNet attempts to do is give as many visual samples to each noun in WordNet. So right now you have around 14 million images in ImageNet. Back then it was 1.2 million images and, and a thousand categories that these images were tagged. So what people were doing and what ImageNet was built for is these yearly challenges. So every year there's an ImageNet challenge and academic groups usually from around the world, um, they, they submit their results based on their, um, first, it, this used to be just computer vision algorithms. Um, since I believe 2015, it's been just deep learning. So everyone kind of switched over to deep learning. This is where Google's Inception V3 came from. This is where BGGNet came from. Um, there's new stuff, especially out of Chinese um, academics that is coming out. So um, you can see the error rate here. So back in 2010, the error rate was around just about 30%. Um, as of last month, uh, it's 2.25%. So it's way below the 5% human error rate. Um, so we're reaching a point where, at least within the um, you know, bounds of the ImageNet challenge, um, things are getting really good with the deep learning algorithms. Um, so back to what we did. So um, we had this plan, because we couldn't train our own database, we could use the ImageNet database and use a pre-trained neural network to kind of tell us what do you see in this image. So we would get the image, 
and we would run it through ImageNet fairly quickly, it would tell us this is a butterfly or this is a, you know, a gastropod. So then we could say, okay, if it's a butterfly, we can run this within our butterfly specific computer vision algorithm and then we would be able to give you fairly good answers. Um, it was still a very limited approach, but it worked pretty well for our purposes. Um, so, fast forward another year, early 2017, um, thanks to adoption by natural history museums, our specimen database um, bubbled up to 2 million images. So, within a year, we went from 10,000 to 2 million. Um, actually, today, we're about to go up to 4 million. Um, so, what this enabled us is to do is um, we could train our own neural network, so we, we didn't have to depend on ImageNet anymore. Um, and this has also coincided with the um, release of TensorFlow. Um, TensorFlow kind of came out earlier, but it wasn't very stable. It was still in the works. And then earlier this year, it went a stable 1.0 release, so we decided to go with TensorFlow. And we were able to um, train our own network, um, which would be able to just, you know, this is our mobile application, but same on the web, same on Android. We could offer this experience to our users where you could upload an image, um, we would immediately, within 200 milliseconds of the image being uploaded, um, we could, with, right now with 87% accuracy, we can tell you which category it belongs to. Um, so, you know, we're, it was an interesting journey, um, and you can kind of see it, you know, it parallels the journey of deep learning. Um, and, you know, we're in a, in a good place, like if, if you have a very specific data set, and if you have a large enough data set, you can achieve quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> So I want to take a few steps back and just talk about neural networks in general. Um, it, as I mentioned before, it's considered a black box, but it's not. The math is actually fairly simple. You just need to understand the, the logic behind it, how it works. So the best example um, I've seen comes from the Google Engineering blog. It's one of their introductory um, articles around TensorFlow. Um, so the, the example that they give is a very simple data set, right? So you have a data set that's just orange dots and blue dots. So um, every dot has obviously an X and a Y value plotted on this chart. So given these X and Y values, how do you separate um, and tell whether it's an orange or a blue dot? So you know you could solve this programmatically without a neural network with this very simple algorithm, right? You could say x plus y, if it's over b, then it's blue, if not it's orange. Um, so how would a neural network solve this? Well, it would do the same thing, but what it does is it adds these weights to each uh, value, that each attribute that it gets from each item. So it says x weight multiplied by x, y weight multiplied by y, and does it go over our bias value, b value. Um, so what happens when you're training is those weight values are adjusted until you reach a certain um, output that's desirable. So until you reach 100% or 97% accuracy, um, you just keep running a training algorithm over and over and over again. And those weight values are shifted a little bit, a little bit, a little bit every time until you reach the correct values. So. There's no magic to it. It's just changing values until you reach a point that's right. But you don't do it in a random manner. Instead of doing it randomly, um, you have this um, basic flow. So the values come in, they're multiplied by their associated weight values, um, that's checked against the bias value, and then the network makes a prediction. It says orange or blue. Um, and then we, the nice thing is we already know whether it's supposed to be orange or blue, so we can say, well, you're wrong, it, sh it should have been orange. So when it's wrong, it can say, okay, I'm gonna shift these values back in the opposite direction that I've been going um, a little bit more. So I get closer to the actual loss or ac actual accuracy that I wanna go for. And, and you run this in an infinite loop until you reach, you reach a certain result. Um, now, you know, when you read TensorFlow documentation, when you read articles, they will say, you know, you just back propagate the values, which is just, it just means shifting the values, like this, the, you know, big words for very simple things. Um, so this is Tensor, uh, TensorFlow Playground. It's a way to visualize these um, algorithms and these models. Um, so this very simple model looks like this. You have these two functions. They call them neurons, but really they're just functions. And 
all these functions do is, in this case, they just check whether the value is above a certain value, right? So it says, is x over zero? Is y over zero? And if it's over zero, fire. So, you know, you will feed your data, and then once you train it for a few minutes, the weights will shift in the right direction, and you will reach, in this case, you know, after a couple of minutes, I got 97% accuracy. If I ran it more, I could probably reach 99% or 100%. Um, now, this is a simple example, obviously. What happens when you have a data set that looks like this? Now, this is a nonlinear problem, so you can't really solve it programmatically, at least not easily. So this is where the neural networks shine, right? So you build a model, again, built up of very sim simple functions that just check for values, and they fire if the value is above a certain number, or you, know, it, you run um, a certain algorithm, and then it just, based on the result, you either fire or not. And you just stack these one after the other. Now, the way you design this, is not just out of scope of this talk, but it's just out of scope of most people. You would most likely not need to design your own neural network model. Um, there are a lot of really good models out there that you can reuse, um, but from my understanding, it's a lot of trial and error, right? So it's not really, there's no real science to it. As you get more into it, obviously you have some idea around what would work and what wouldn't, but um, you know, getting to this point, and having a, having a, you know a good model that just works for your data set um, is um, it takes time and a lot of trial and error. Um, but luckily for us, um, for instance, this is the Google's Inception V3 model. Um, it has you know 21 hidden layers, um, multiple stacks of neurons or functions inside each layer. Um, you know there are pooling methods and you know. There's all this like very complicated flow, but you don't necessarily need to interface with it directly. This is a model that you use. This is great for image recognition or image analysis. So if you're going to do image analysis, either you use this or you use VGGNet or something similar that's just um, pre-designed for you. Um, so what's network training? Um, let's talk about that a little bit. It's um, because I think this is where things get really interesting um, from a software development perspective. Because there is this kind of chasm between the tutorials that use the ImageNet database or some pre-trained database. So there's only so much you can do with them. They only were trained to do one thing. And then there's you know, model design, which is just way too complicated and it takes way too much time. But in between, you could use existing models on your own data set to do some really interesting things. And I think that's where uh, focusing um, your efforts makes make a lot of sense. So training basically involves a few steps. Um, the most important ones are not training and testing. Those are kind of solved problems. If you use TensorFlow or Keras or Cafe or any of the existing platforms, Training and testing is not going to be a big problem for you. Um, but data gathering and balancing, so gathering your data set and making sure it's balanced across the results that you want, and then pre-processing that data in a way that will work well with your, uh, the results that you want, is really the, the critical steps. So um, if, you, uh, if you don't have a data set but you want to work with neural networks, um, Kaggle.com is a really good resource. Um, they basically have these open data sets that you can download, and there are actually challenges associated with them as well. So an example that I played with um, a couple of months ago is 10 years of movie posters from IMDb with um, attached movie data. So you know the challenge was, can you build a neural network that will guess the genre of the movie uh, based on its poster? You know, interesting problem. Um, you probably can't, but you know, it's uh, I, I, at least you know that that was the result of the challenge. It's just there's not enough um, data and there's not enough commonalities between these two guess uh, at a high accuracy rate. But it's still interesting to play with because again, you don't need to you know build your own model. It's more about training and how you prepare the data. Um, so what's interesting though in a, in a database like this is, so you, get, you have your data set, but it's not gonna be balanced. So you can't just take all the movie posters and 
put them into Inception V3 and hope that it will work. You got to balance it out across your results. So let's say you're training for genre results and you have 20 genres. So if you have 10,000 movie posters, you need around 500 posters per each genre. You can't just have, you know, 2,000 sci-fi posters and 500 uh, comedy posters. It's not going to work because your network is going to then shift towards sci-fi. So it will say sci-fi more often than comedy. So you got to let go of some of your database and you got to make sure that it's balanced across. Um, this is an art unto its own, right? Like people spend a lot of time and we've spent a lot of time balancing our data sets because sometimes it's not possible. We don't have the same number of images in a certain subcategory of butterflies versus others. So you have to kind of find a good balance and you have to keep retraining to get the results that you want. Um, another pre-processing example is, let's say you were dealing with, you know, there's a famous data set for, um, you know, public figures in public environments. So they have tons of photos and they have the, the locations of the faces with the identifier names um, in every photo. Um, so, you know, you get the full photo, but you would never use the, the full photo itself for training. You would need to, you know, extract the facial features um, in a bounding box. And then uh, what you usually do, you do something called data augmentation. So you take the photos and then based on the usages that you foresee, you will rotate them slightly in random, you know, uh, random ranges. Um, so let's say you have 10,000 photos, you would actually end up having a data set of, of 50,000 photos because you would you know, rotate and add and rotate and add and you would have like five, six different versions of, of the same image. Um, another option that, that you have is um, flattening, for instance, for facial features for human faces. Um, what's been proven and what Facebook uses, for instance, is um, taking the image and then figuring out the 3D um, spatial um, uh, angle that it's uh, sitting at and then um, basically rotating that and shifting it in a way that will always be normalized across your data set. So, uh, you know, whichever angle the photo is taken from then, you're able to again do the same thing on the input image and you can, uh, you, you can have very high accuracy. So facial recognition after this method started being applying, it kind of just uh, skyrocketed in terms of um, accuracy. Um, Another good example is, I think everyone knows, the uh, Silicon Valley is not hot talk. Um, now, the reason why this is a good example is not because of the, the idea, but because they've actually built the app, and then they had a really great write-up on how they built it. Um, now, obviously, their training set was very specific, but they still had to spend a lot of time figuring out how this data set should be balanced and what kind of data they need to put in, inside. So, for instance, Instead of doing the usual 45 degree angle rotation and augmentation, they used 135 degrees because um, people could take photos of hot dogs from any angle. So they had to foresee how their data set was going to be using and their input data was going to be like, and they had to plan for it and train for that. Um, another interesting problem they ran into, they foresaw that people were going to search for uh, like Google image you know, hot dog pictures and then take photos of them on the screen. Now when they tried that, it didn't work because there was screen glare, um, you know, there was just weird ar artifacts coming from taking a photo of a screen. So they had to, again, add that to their training set. Like, so they had a considerable amount of screenshots um, to their data set so they could cover those cases. Um, so that's kind of pre-processing and preparing. Um, when you get to training, um, uh, whenever I read articles online, I see a lot of people training on their laptop or you know they buy like external GPU units but um, I don't know why there's a stigma against like using cloud services but you know just going to something like AWS there's tons of um, pre-built AMIs that you can actually just launch so you know you go on AWS you search for TensorFlow AMIs um, and you will get a pre-built you know Linux server ready to go uh, with you know you can have one with like two GPU units eight GPU units 16 GPU units um, our database of um, currently 4 million images takes around 10 days to um, train on my laptop. It takes less than 20 hours on an 8 GPU um, AWS instance. So, you know, it doesn't make sense to, when you have to train and train and train again, um, it doesn't make sense to spend all that time trying to do this locally. Of course, you need a local environment, but you've got to use the right tools for your actual training. 
Um, so what happens while training? So let's say um, you use TensorFlow. Um, what you would do is you would put aside around 10% of your uh, training set um, for testing. So you would never use that for training because obviously you can't have, if you have your test data within your training data, then it's just gonna give you really good results and make you really happy, but it's not gonna work. So you gotta set aside around 10%, that seems to be the magic number. And um, what you gotta watch for there is you gotta evenly distribute your 10% as well. So you can't just randomly take you know, some posters. Again, they need to be distributed across um, you know, according to the genres and the, or whatever uh, results that you're expecting. Um, <clears throat> so what will happen is there's uh, TensorFlow actually what it does, it, as it's training your network, it will at the same time test it um, in parallel. So uh, you can launch the TensorBoard uh, web environment um, on whatever machine you're running and you can live, you know, see the, the accuracy of your results. And what you want to see is something like this, where the accuracy increases over time and then plateaus at some point. Um, this is called convergence. So they will say, did your neural network converge? It just means that you know it's trained to a point where you can use it. Um, so that's just what you're looking for. Um, one last tip about training is, um, I personally ran into this problem. Uh, so when you're writing your TensorFlow, um, training um, scripts, um, they're usually fairly simple if you're using a pre-trained um, model, but um, what you gotta look for is, for instance, um, here what you're seeing is the, you gotta use the name, the optional name and scope variables a lot. Um, so some samples that you see online don't use these, but what happens is you train your network, you spend all this time, you're done, you reach the accuracy that you wanted, and then you need to now use it for actually predicting results. And at that point, you need to reference these variables. And if you didn't give them names, you will have to hunt through the, you know, the weird configuration files and find the you know, random names that TensorFlow gave them. So just, you know, just creating these scopes and creating these you know, optional names helps a lot, um, because otherwise you can't reference them very easily. So um, what happens when your training is done? You get peanut butter. Um, basically, this is the loving name that the community gives to these PB files, uh, protocol buffer files that TensorFlow creates. Um, this is usually a fairly large file that contains all the um, nodes that you trained on, um, all the functions that you've used in your uh, network, and all the weight values, um, and you know all the other uh, variables that you might have set set up with their names and their values over time. Um, so. This is really the only file, the contained binary that you can use to, for instance, embed into um, an iOS application, into an Android application, or if you want to run on your server, you would use the exact same file. Um, all right, so finally we get to how we, how we use this on iOS. Um, but um, before you jump to conclusions about you know, embedding a neural network on your device, on, a, on, a, on an application, um, I would say think twice, like, do you actually have the need to do this? Because it's a lot easier to run this on an API at a service level and just, you know, upload the images and get results. That's what we did for three years and our users were fairly happy. The only reason we did offline training is because, um, you know, we have these naturalists who go out into the wild and they want to snap live specimens and they want to see identification immediately without capturing the specimen. So we had a very specific use case that this was needed for, and that's why we added offline. I think in most cases, you don't need to embed a full neural network into your app unless you have a very specific use case. Um, so as I mentioned, the landscape has changed quite a bit. So TensorFlow has been around for a few years, um, and it's been very mobile focused. You know, it's cross-platform. It offers Android and iOS. Um, but Apple introduced Core ML in June. Um, it's a really good contender for a lot of cases. So, you know, when I submitted this talk, TensorFlow was kind of the best option. Now, I wouldn't say so unless you need to use TensorFlow. I would say Core ML is a better option. Um, and then, since iOS 10, we had um, metal performance shaders for running um, the same methods on the GPU or similar functions. 
and we had the Accelerate Frameworks BNNs for a while. Uh, there was a really good talk on that just before this one, so if you didn't catch it, um, I think the video will be up. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about TensorFlow. Um, it's cross-platform, and that's the biggest thing going forward. So if you have an Android application as well, like we do, um, it's kind of a no-brainer. Like we don't want to redo all these things for different platforms in different ways. Um, I think we'll stick with TensorFlow for now. Um, but it is a C++ library, not impossible to work with, but not fun either. Um, adds around 40 megabytes to your final binary size. This is before you add the protocol buffer file. So, um, you know, you, you got to keep that in mind. It is a fairly large uh, binary. Um, it runs on the Accelerate framework, so uh, it will only run on CPU. Um, this is not such a bad thing per se, because, I mean, it's, you know, jury's still out about that. Like, you have to train on GPU, but running inference and, you know, providing results, you're fine. You can run on CPU or GPU. It won't tax the system as much um, or not even close, like there's no comparison uh, because it's a pre-trained model. You're just running through these pre-trained functions with ready-to-go weights like we've seen. So all you're doing is just providing these values to these functions, running it through, and then, you know, depending on the size of your model, um, you might not feel the difference as much. Um, and you cannot compile with bit code if you want to use TensorFlow. Now, not a problem for us because we use Objective-C, but just to keep in mind. Um, <clears throat> so, how do you get it in? Um, actually, um, I kind of lied before, you don't take that PB file as is, because TensorFlow um, includes a lot of additional stuff that you don't need, and actually some of it won't even compile on iOS or Android. So, what they provide is this freeze graph um, script within the TensorFlow repo. So it's an official script that you run on your PB file, and you will need to provide the actual names of those actual values that you want, but what it will do is it will um, basically simplify it and make it ready to be embedded into a mobile application. Um, and then you can also run the optimize for inference um, script. Again, it simplifies it even further to just focus your model um, that was kind of built for training, uh, from a training set, um, just for inference. So, you know, you can't run further training um, data sets on it, but that's, you won't do that on, on mobile anyway, so what you will do is just use that simplified PB file. Um, and then you import that file into your Xcode project, um, and the actual implementation of a TensorFlow um, uh, inference system is actually fairly simple. Like, it's not as simple as this. I simplified this quite a bit, but, you know, what you will do is, uh, you know, you will create your session, your TensorFlow session. You would load that PB file into memory. Um, you will put that into the session, and then you will just tell it, you know, which um, attributes to you're feeding in, um, which um, variables that you want. Again, those named variables. Um, and then you will tell it which nodes to run on, which are kind of defined in the model file. Um, so then you run it, and then it gives you some outputs that you can use. Um, and those are just the predefined outputs. So let's say we were running a poster through our you know, movie poster database, then what we would get is the name of the genre, right? Or multiple names of the genre with their accuracy results. So that's the answer flow. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Core ML because, um, again, it's a good contender. Um, Right now, it has limited support for training engines and layer types. So you can't just take any uh, model that you've trained and put it into Core ML. Um, but it does support quite a bit. I mean, it's, it supports Cafe and Keras 1.2 right now. So Keras is like a toolkit that's built on top of TensorFlow. So most people who do training just use Keras um, because it's simpler, it's Pythonic, it's very easy to use. Um, and Apple does support it, uh, but for instance, they only support 1.2, Keras is at 2.0. So, you know, I assume they will have support, but I don't know when. Um, it's hard to tell with Apple. Um, now, uh, you can use custom models, obviously, but you will need to convert them into um, ML model files that, that Apple uh, provides. Um, and one thing that Core ML does is it picks CPU or GPU automatically. It's a black box, you don't know which one it's going to take. You can force it to use CPU. Uh, I think 11 beta 4 added an attribute that you can do that, but you can't force it to use GPU right now. It might change. 
Now, Apple provides a lot of pre-trained models on the ImageNet database. So you have Inception Me 3, you have VGG 16, both past ImageNet challenge winners. Um, and these are just like pre-trained model files that you can put straight into your app and you, know, you can run the famous demo of identifying objects around you. Um, I don't think this is very useful. It's a cool demo, but I, I don't see anyone using this in production. So most likely you wouldn't use these pre-trained models that Apple provides, unless you have a case that somehow fits that. Um, but um, two, there are two more interesting um, networks that they provide. One is MobileNet. Uh, it's again from Google. It's optimized for mobile devices. It's not as accurate as Inception, but it's pretty close. And the, the size difference is uh, quite big. So Inception is around 100 megabytes. Um, mobile net is around 14 megabytes, I believe. So there's a big difference. Um, now, the reason why this is interesting is because you can use mobile net to train on. So, for instance, you would you know, take your data set, instead of training with Inception, you would train with mobile net, which is something that we are working on now as well, because it just, there's less memory overhead, uh, there's less storage space that you need, less that you need to you know, transfer over the network. So um, it's something to keep in mind. Um, SqueezeNet is very similar. It's another group. It's even smaller. It's around 5 megabytes. Um, accuracy is slightly lower, but it's comparable. So um, you know, it's stuff to keep in mind. These are ready-to-go models that are open that can be used on your data sets. Um, so what if you have a custom model? Um, you basically use Apple's core ML tools to convert it into an ML model, and then you embed that in your application. Um, at runtime, um, Xcode just compiles this into an ML model C uh, file, I believe, that it then uses and loads into your um, core ML functions. So uh, using core ML in true Apple fashion is super simple. It's what you would expect. It's very swifty. Um, you know, you load up your model, um, and then you create a VM core ML request, and it just gives you um, results. That's it. Um, you obviously can't do training with core ML, um, but for pre-trained databases, uh, pre-trained networks, that is the most common case, I think it's a very good option. Um, last but not least, there's the low-level API behind Core ML uh, Metal. Um, always runs on GPU. Um, Apple is, I think, really pushing hard on um, growing the Metal APIs. Um, got tons of additional features with iOS 11. Uh, they're supporting it heavily. So if you for some reason need to build your own, um, you know, either training system on iOS or you need to kind of like build something that just doesn't fit within the confines of Core ML, this is probably where to go. Um, I'm not even going to bother showing a code, in a code sample. Apple has the full Inception V3 uh, model re-implemented in Metal uh, as sample code, so you can download and check that out. They have a simple version and a, and a very long version. And um, it's interesting. Um, now, with Metal, you can use PB files. Uh, you just need to convert them into these binaries, but they're just floating points, numbers in a binary file. So it is possible to train on TensorFlow, export that fairly simply, and then import that into a Metal shader. Um, so, you know, it's definitely in the realm of possibility. All right, last thing I'm going to talk about is delivering updates. Um, so, TensorFlow PB files can be transferred over the network, uh, can be embedded in your, into your app on runtime. We do this with the background download APIs, um, and you know we have weekly updates going out um, automatically. Um, with Core ML, this wasn't possible until last week when Apple added the compile method uh, to ML model files. So you can now deliver over the air without an update, and you know you can compile. Um, so it's just loaded up in runtime, and you can use them, which is pretty cool. Um, all right, so to recap, um, train your own data sets. Uh, I think that's the most viable way of using ne neural networks. Um, use TensorFlow plus Keras. I think it's still the best platform uh, available right now. Um, use Core ML if you can. If it works for you, it's the simplest solution on iOS. Um, and if you need to go Android plus iOS, I would still recommend TensorFlow because it's just going to save you a lot of cycles. Um, 
there is really good and open articles and documentation on source code available. Um, Matthew Solomons is has a blog called machinethink.net, uh, focused on iOS, focused on TensorFlow, really good content. Um, Reza Shirazian has some um, core ML uh, training um, <coughs> articles that I've seen recently. Um, Apple samples are pretty good. There's, as I mentioned, the metal sample. Uh, there's a ton of core ML samples. And Google's TensorFlow docs are actually really good as well. So if you want to just set up you know, a core, uh, TensorFlow demo, for instance, it will take you around 15 minutes. It's super fast, very clear. Thank you. That's it.